Well, thank you very much for this opportunity um, to, to speak in front of you uh, today. And um, well, so yeah, I'm going to talk about mostly soil um, soil erosion uh, during the Holocene in, in the European Alps, but uh, I'll just, uh, just a quick word about myself first. Um, so um, I've been doing my, my PhD in, in between uh, Chambéry and Paris in France, uh, between the ATM laboratory and, and the IPGP in Paris. And after a um, few uh, postdoc position, now I'm uh, working on a NEOC project. Um, and the, the main topic of it is to try to understand and to quantify the effect of human activities and, and climate fluctuations on erosion and weathering um, in the European Alps. Um, so um, to go directly to the, to the topic of uh, today, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure all of you um, work on the same field. So um, you, you know all those questions that we ask ourselves uh, while working on Anthropocene and trying to understand the impact and the effect of, of human activities on, on the environment. But still, I just want to go back to some um, important question. And I, I suppose this one, um, is the most important of all is um, how to to disentangle how to decipher uh, the effect of climate variability and um, human activities uh, while working on uh, natural archives, uh, especially because um, every time um, human activities have uh, impacted the environment, um, it's almost well, at the same time as one of the major uh, climate fluctuations during the Holocene, um, especially in Europe, uh, we can take the example of the Roman Roman period um, that happened at the same time as um, the war, Roman warm period. Uh, so that's that's something, and it's it's really hard usually to well, to disentangle um, the effect of uh, the different forcing factors. Um, then the other question is uh, which arch archive should I choose to to work on that topic? Uh, so thankfully it was kind of easy for me because in Editem in Chambéry we are uh, kind of uh, only working on on lake sediments. So during my PhD it was uh, obviously um, the the archive uh, uh, we we chose, uh, and well. That's also that's also great because uh, lake sediments are very good recorders of what what is happening in a catchment um, in terms of extreme events such as uh, floods or earthquakes or um, volcanic activity or or else, but also in terms of uh, climate fluctuations and uh, land use, and they can register that. Um, of a long, a long time period and in a continuous way, which is uh, pretty great. Uh, then um, we have to, to decide what trace, what activity, what um, proxy to of human activity um, to follow. And so he, um, I just plotted a, a nice figure uh, from one of your paper, Natalie, on um, so a, a review from uh, the Anthropocene Review, uh, published in 2018, and um, as we were a bit lazy, I have to say that uh, we decided to work probably on the on the easiest uh, trace of all, uh, soil erosion. So I'm not sure it's it's the easiest, but at least it's probably one of the easiest to to track uh, using classic sedimentological approach. So here um, you can see. Um, some figures from a paper of Jean-Philippe Genie published in PNAS in, in 2019. Um, and so he used um, sediment accumulation rate for uh, from um, 600 lakes at least uh, in order to track um, human human impact on, on soil erosion um, through the, throughout the Holocene. Um, and well, it's, it's pretty good. Um, and he has been able, and he, has, he and his team has been able to um, kind of um, not really disentangle, but at least highlight uh, the time period when um, human activity uh, really starts uh, impacting the environment. But yet, 
um, it's still hard to um, quantify directly the effect of uh, human activities on, on soil erosion. Um, and another point is um, it's really important to work on, on soil erosion as well, because um, for um, several decades now, um, soil loss is uh, becoming a threat for human societies, as uh, stated by um, the IPCC, the GRC, and other uh, research groups. And just because, well, soil erosion impacts uh, fruit production, uh, drinking water quality, biodiversity, carbon stock shrinkage, and else. And so um, that's why uh, those research groups uh, just called for a quantitative assessment at large scale and long time scale of, of soil erosion and also of um, the uh, quantification of the forcing factors that affect uh, um, soil erosion. Um, another imp important question is um, where where to go uh, for this kind of uh, of study, uh, and over what time period. So the first question uh, we ask ourselves um, to select a, a study site was where is erosion um, the highest, and so what we can see here from this figure um, from Panagos published in twenty fifteen is that well so that's a map. Um, of um, a modeled uh, erosion, uh, well, modeled soil loss uh, in, the Euro in Europe. And what you can see here is that um, the highest um, values are recorded or are displayed in um, mountain areas. So we said, okay, well, let's go for mountain areas, uh, but then, uh, well, which one? And so we've been looking, as I said before, we're a bit lazy. So we've been looking to uh, the places where uh, we have uh, the most uh, most important information about uh, human activities since the Neolithic period, and um, well, Europe is pretty uh, well documented for that. Uh, here you have a map of um, coming from a, a paper of uh, Foley published in uh, 2013, um, uh, showing the the Neolithic um, uh, trajectories, and so as you can see, well. Um, at least from the middle of the Holocene, you have a lot of um, activity uh, throughout the entire Europe. Um, then, well, so mountain area, Europe, so let's go for the European Alps. Um, and well, that's, that's great because in this place, we have a lot of information about climate fluctuation through time, um, which is pretty nice. And we also have a lot of um, archeological sites, um, well, natural archives that have been uh, studied for um, land use and, and so on. So we have a lot of information there. And we have distinct uh, climate context uh, on all the different sides of the Alps. Uh, that could be great. And it's kind of easy to find uh, lakes there. So, well, it's pretty nice. Uh, in terms of time periods, um, the Eocene is great because um, it's a period quite analogous compared to present days. Um, at least in terms of uh, geodyn geodynamic and, and climate, uh, we can almost consider that um, the effect of te tectonic on erosion is almost constant. Um, and so that that's nice. Uh, and <clears throat> and we have also uh, different climate climate context uh, throughout throughout this time period. And the good thing about the Holocene is also that in Europe, uh, as we can see in, on this map here, um, the period is long enough to cover uh, period without any uh, human activities impacting the, um, the erosion. Uh, well, then um, where to go and um, which leg to, 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 to select to, to do um, this kind of study. So here you have a figure coming from a paper from Fabien Arnaud published in uh, 2016. And um, what he was trying to do to say here is that if you go for a high elevation site, um, you will probably be able to only have an information about uh, the evolution of climate through time. Uh, even though um, we saw that usually um, all the high elevation sites uh, could be affected by human activities uh, anyway. Um, or, or at least you have to go uh, very close to um, glaciers. Um, <clears throat> then, if you go for a mid-elevation site, or at least at lower altitude, you will have uh, information about land use. 
Um, and if you go for uh, low lowland peripheral pine lakes, um, you will probably have a regionally integrated signal um, where you will have information about climate fluctuations and, and land use through time. Um, but then, um, still, this, the, the first question remains, how to decipher natural climate variability and human impact uh, on, on, the, on the lake sediment and on the, on the erosion record in there? So um, we really need to develop uh, an approach. And I don't know if the one we uh, choose to develop was the good one, but at least we, we tried. And I will uh, present to you today the, the result that we just obtained. Um, so first thing is um, trying to find the perfect catchment. So as I said before, um, we've been looking for a catchment in the European Alps. And I also uh, said to you before that uh, we are a bit lazy. So <laughs> we decided to go just for next door. So here you can see the catchment, uh, a 3D map of the catchment of Lake Bourget, which is located just a few kilometers away from um, the lab in Chambéry. Um, and well, it's a pretty good, great, great catchment. It's uh, one of the largest catchments in, in the European Alps, uh, covering um, almost uh, 5,000 kilometers square. And the interesting thing is um, here we can find glaciated areas in the Mont Blanc Massif, um, so that are like, located at high altitudes where no human activities have ever impacted um, erosion um, throughout the Holocene. And the good, the good point is that, so uh, in the rest of the catchment, in the non-glaciated part of the catchment, we also have uh, areas where human activities have um, developed through time um, at mid and high altitude and, and uh, low altitude. Um, so that's one thing. So one place where no human activities has ever uh, impact um, erosion and, and the rest of the catchment where, um, well, since the Neolithic, um, some activities uh, have been developed. And the good thing is uh, those two parts of the catchment present uh, distinct uh, lithologies. Um, so in the upper part, in the glaciated area, we have uh, granite and uh, metamorphic rocks. And in the rest of the catchment in the non-glaciated region, we have sedimentary rocks. And so thanks to um, isotopic geochemistry measurements, um, we can be able to track the contribution of each uh, region through time uh, in order to try to uh, well understand the effect of um, human activity on, on erosion. But I will go into more details just after. Um, so before that, uh, we had to make um, we have to make three main assumptions. So the first one is um, the erosion in the glacier uh, covered region is only linked to climate. Um, so, well, that's pretty obvious. The second one is um, in the non glaciated region, um, it's well, climate and land use that have affected um, the erosion rate through time. And uh, the third one, uh, which is a bit tricky, is uh, if climate shifts were the sole factor of changes in erosion, they would affect equally any part of the catchment. But we'll go back to this one uh, later on. So uh, we decided to develop, uh, to use a source to sink approach. So we've been in the catchment, uh, sampling um, sediments from uh, the main rivers and the main tributaries. Um, and we also been um, to the sink, uh, so covering um, the, the Lake Bourget, which is kind of difficult because uh, it's a deep lake, uh, almost 150 meters deep. Um, so we were in need of using a, a big uh, covering platform and that uh, has been developed by UV Tech and, and the CNRS. Uh, and we've been able to call almost 16 meters of sediments there. Um, so after the curing, well, I guess you all know that, then we have to open all of those curls, describe them, uh, and do some classic sedimentological uh, and geochemical analysis in order to try to understand the different type of sedimentation there. So here we were not focusing on event layers, we were only focusing on background sediments. 
And um, thanks to all of those measurements, uh, we've been able to uh, compute the, the concentration of uh, autogenic um, um, sediment and detrital uh, inputs. And uh, to only uh, work on the detrital input to get rid of all the autogenic carbonates that are kind of uh, highly concentrated in, in Lake Bourget, we had to leach all of our sediments. Well, then, um, well, I guess you all know that as well. We've been able, we, we had to, to um, develop the good HDF model. So here it is. Um, so we've been doing some valve counting on, on the upper part of the core. Um, we also have some um, short life radionuclides uh, measurements and then, um, and then a lot of C14 ages um, throughout all the, the entire sediment core. And so thanks to that, uh, we obtain well, the classic um, sediment accumulation rates. But then, well, how to really assess erosion through time? Um, the first thing is, um, well, to work only on the um, silicate erosion, uh, we want to work only on silic siliciclastic flux. So we try to compute that. Um, and so we, uh, we use um, the sedimentation rate, the density, and the, pro the proportion of detrital silicates um, measured uh, in the lake. Then, um, thanks to thanks to this, so here we plotted it against um, the age here. Um, so we obtained an erosion flux in the, uh, from the sediment core, and we also uh, did some measurements um, uh, of isotopic geochemistry. So we used neodymium here. Um, so you have the main results obtained uh, on the core here, presented here uh, through time. So the present is here. And uh, we've been doing the same measurements uh, in the catchment on the river sediments. And thanks to that, uh, we've been able to compute a mixing model, allowing us to uh, calculate the contribution of each of the two regions through time. Um, so when we have the siliciclastic flux, we also know the, um, the lake area, so we can obtain a, a stock of sediments. Um, then we also know now, thanks to the mixing model, the proportion, the contribution of each of the two regions uh, in terms of erosion through time. And by knowing the, the area of each region, uh, we can compute a sediment yield. So, well, that's our erosion rate uh, signal. So thanks to those math, um, we obtain an erosion rate for the glaciated uh, region and an erosion rate for the non-glaciated region. So let's see a bit the results now. Um, so as I said just before, we have two curves. The orange one represents the erosion in the non-glaciated region and the blue one in the glaciated region. Um, what we said is um, that this curve, the blue curve, um, is only impacted by uh, climate, so climate fluctuation. And I mean um, precipitation and uh, glaciers advances and retreats. Um, for the orange one, it's a bit more complicated. In fact, it's, um, it's, the, it's the sum of the effect of climate and human activity um, that are represented here. But if we look a bit at the, the early Holocene, what we can see is that one well, the two curves seems uh, roughly the same uh, with the same trend. And so low, uh, low erosion rates and the exact same trend. And well, at that time period, um, the, there is no real uh, human activity uh, developed in the catchment. And that kind of validates our third assumption uh, that stated that if climate shifts were the sole factor of changes in erosion, they would affect equally any part of the catchment. So, well, that's that's one first thing. So, if we um, if we plot the the blue curve, uh, normalized blue curve, onto the orange one, we can see that from the early Holocene to um, four point eight um, thousand years before present, we have a constant erosion. Then we start to see an increase. Um, so this first increase is probably linked to uh, the neoglacial period. And then we can see that uh, some differences emerge from the two, the two curves. 
Um, and what I mean here is that uh, the orange curve, so the erosion in an unglaciated area, seems to be higher uh, than the one in the glaciated region. Um, so that means that probably climate alone cannot explain um, this, this orange curve uh, since 3.8 thousand years before present. So we can um, try to uh, compute this, this excess of erosion in the orange um, orange curve. So that's what I've been uh, done here uh, in the lower part of the figure here. Um, so this is a factor. It's not directly an effect, uh, an excess. But what we can see from this factor is that um, as early as 3.8 thousand years, we have a 2 to 2.5 fold increase um, in, in terms of erosion in the non-glaciated part of the catchment. And this increase is not linked to um, climate, it's not explained by climate as uh, it's the difference uh, between the normalized uh, erosion curve from the glaciated region uh, compared to the, to the one in the, gla the non-glaciated region. So, um, well, our first assumption was, well, then it's linked to human activity, but how to be sure about that? So um, to, to go a bit further, we decided to work uh, on all the information that we already have from previous studies um, uh, in, the, in the catchment or close to the catchment of Lake Bourget. Um, and what I mean about that is uh, looking to all the pollen and eDNA um, analysis that has been um, done uh, in the northern French Alps. Um, so recently, um, Charlene Gigekovex and, and other people from uh, the lab in Chambéry and from uh, other labs decided to create an index of agro-pastoral activities thanks to the combination of, of some proxies um, from pollen and uh, eDNA. Um, so we decided to divide uh, our catchment into three different um, altitude areas. Um, so you have the different colors here on, onto the 3D map of the catchments. And um, really close to the catchment, we have two, um, two sites that have been uh, studied um, and where we have um, some index of agro-pastoral activities for the last 2,000 years and for uh, the last uh, for the entire uh, Holocene, so uh, Lake Iqbalet and Lake Paladol. Um, we also have at mid altitude, so in between, well, a thousand and two thousand meters high, uh, um, two thousand meter of elevation. We also have um, three three sites in the catchment, so um, that are displayed here, where we have um, a good index of agropastoral activities um, that covers almost the entire Holocene. And then um, in the catchment and re very close to the catchment, we also have three other sites at high altitude, so uh, above uh, 2,000 meters high, um, that uh, also um, uh, present some pollen and eDNA measurements that have been, uh, and we've been able to convert them into an, an index of agropastoral activities. Okay, then um, we decided that it could be good to compare this to our um, erosion signal. So we transform those signals in a uh, box plot that only covers um, and represents um, a chronocultural periods. So you have here uh, a box plot for the pre-anthropic period, one for the Neolithic, um, one for the early Bronze Age, and, and so on um, towards the present. And so, uh, so we gathered all those signals um, for the three um, uh, distinct uh, altitudinal range, so one for the foothill, one for the mid altitude, and one for uh, the high altitude. Okay, and then uh, if we do the same thing to our uh, erosion curve, we can compare um, those two signals. So it's the, um, the excess of, uh, of erosion, so the what we ca can call the effect of human activities on erosion rates. So that was our assumption. Um, so same thing here, uh, the curve is transformed into box plots. And so if we have a look at uh, all of this data, uh, what we can see is, um, so before 3.8 thousand years before present, 
uh, we have no, um, well, a really low um, erosion rate and we have no effects, uh, no excess of erosion in the non-glaciated part of the catchment. And that's pretty cool because uh, we see um, well, almost no uh, human activities, um, at least agro-pastoral activities in the catchment. But then we, we have our first um, erosion crisis uh, from 3.8 thousand years until uh, the Roman period. And yes, the interesting thing here is that um, we can see that it's not really related to what um, seems to happen in the foothills, uh, neither to the mid altitudes, where um, we have almost no um, index of um, agro-pastoral activities at that time. But it's pretty, it's, it's pretty well um, comparable to what happened at high altitude. And so that's quite interesting. So probably the first um, impact of human activity started at high altitude first. And then, so we see a decrease of uh, erosion after the Roman period and another increase then. Um, and that doesn't seem to be related to what happened at high altitude, but rather to what happened to uh, at mid altitude um, in the catchments and also probably uh, in the foothills. So we can observe this, this the exact same shape here and here. And so uh, how to interpret that? So it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, so probably the, the thing here is um, the development of, of, of pastoral activities at high altitude led to the first uh, erosion crisis uh, during the late Bronze Age towards the Roman period. And then uh, we see a first decrease at the end of the Roman period. And uh, the, the second uh, erosion crisis is linked probably to uh, the development of the agriculture and the, the advent of the plow. Um, so those activities were um, developed at uh, low to mid altitude during the Middle Ages. And then uh, we, have a, we have a decrease in modern times, uh, probably linked to both uh, the decrease in the uh, amount of total population and the decrease of the activities uh, as well in the region. Um, well, so that's uh, almost it. Um, so uh, this work just um, been published in Nature Communication um, earlier this year. And the, the, main, the main conclusion that we uh, can make from that is that, um, well, we tried and, and uh, we we're pretty close to um, quantitatively disentangle the effect of climate and human activities on soil erosion there, uh, which is pretty great. And, um, and the, main, the main conclusions are, um, well, up to 3.8 thousand years before present, it's the climate um, that is the only driver of erosion. But from that time on, um, climate alone cannot explain um, the, the measured erosion rates. So uh, it, it's probably the development of pastoralism at high altitude and then uh, during the Bronze Age, and um, then the development of the agriculture at mid to low altitude um, at the beginning of the Middle Ages that are the key factors in the uh, increase of uh, erosion observed in the Alps. Um, well, that's almost it, I guess. Um, I will be very happy to discuss um, with you if you have any question, and um, and thank you again for um, inviting me to present this today. <laughs>